part in the afternoon. So, so Carrie, how was how was the class today? I think it went very well. You know, I got very good uh, response, very nice comments. Uh, you know, the comments were great. So I think it I think it went well. Great, great. Yeah. So people were actually asking you questions at the end. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They were asking questions all the way through. Oh, great. Great. And, you know, yeah. you have so, a unique course that you give. Yep. Because no one talks about yes. blood work. Yep. Yes. Yeah, this is kind of unique, a little different. And they were very engaged. Uh, they, you know, a number of people asked me for, uh, sent the emails and asked me for uh, the slides. So I sent them over. Well, you know, it's interesting. A lot of people feel very insecure about their knowledge around this topic. Um so I guess it's it's good that you were able to step up and actually try to show show folks that it's not that scary, right? <laughs> yeah, it really isn't. You know, it just it's just practice like anything else. Right. Do you, do know, you actually we, draw you blood? Do it, do it enough times. It, it just it, it's real. It's really hmm. it's really pretty easy. Do you, do you actually draw blood in in your practice? No, no, no. I refer out. You know, depending on their insurance. You know, that's a good question because I I did for a while. Uh, I had a phlebotomist come in, and I had an account with a company called Singulex, hmm. and they would come in, and we'd make an appointment, and they would come in and do it, but the most important test that I do is a two-hour insulin, and they just couldn't get that right. Mm -hmm. You know, they have some inflammatory, proprietary inflammatory markers that they do, Singulex, which are pretty interesting, because, you know, obviously we're dealing with AMD, you know, diabetics, and inflammatory markers are interesting, but they just couldn't get the insulin stuff right. So I had to go back to LabCorp and uh, Quest. And my first choice is always LabCorp. If the patient's insurance uh, is accepted by LabCorp, I'll refer them over there. Right, and I know that most regions do have a LabCorp somewhere uh, nearby. So, you know, I think for anyone who's going to be, uh, you know, writing prescriptions for, for blood draws, definitely check out the labs in your area to make sure you actually like yeah. them. And the thing is, is that the Singulex wouldn't charge of, you know, if the, if the, as long as they had insurance, but if it was like a co if it was like a deductible, like a $500 deductible, they wouldn't, they wouldn't charge the patient. So it was like, great, but they just couldn't get that test right. Right. So I guess my big question is, you know, you, you mentioned insulin. What are some of the big indications for you to actually order a blood draw? Well, you know, there's a number of conditions we see as, you know, as optometrists. You know, if they have if they have a big change in the prescription, so we have a shift. So t typically, it's a hyperopic shift, not a myopic shift. Myopic shifts are, you know, more typical, especially as we as as the patient uh, uh, ch changes. And we usually optometrists don't make a big deal about it unless it's a big myopic shift. In optometry school, we learned that myopic shift was the the number one shift when somebody was diabetic. But in clinical practice, uh, we I find otherwise. It's typically a hyperopic shift. So somebody is typically minus two, and now they're minus fifty. I always send them for for a blood draw, or if they have uh, a, a retinal hemorrhage. The reason why I started doing this is because uh, patients would come in would have retinal hemorrhages. I refer them out to their internists and or family practice doctors, and they would do blood draws, and they always would tell me that there was nothing wrong with the patient. And, you know, people don't get retinal hemorrhages for no reason. I mean, there's, there's a reason. I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's probably over a thousand different markers or different blood tests that we could do. You know, obviously you're not going to do a thousand blood tests, but I study uh, integrative medicine and functional medicine. And I, I did a lot of coursework on vascular biology. And when I started seeing hemorrhages and, and reading about different biomarkers, I had a feeling that it could be from elevated insulin, uh, or at least fasting with two-hour insulin. Typically, that's what it turned out to be. Uh, I also have a multispectral imaging instrument in my office, an Anitas. Hmm. Uh, Anitas has uh, a number. It peels away the retina. It gives you different unfos, uh retinal pictures, right. and the 580 nanometer highlights the oxygen A, the hemoglobin, making uh, the retinal vasculature very visible. So in the 580 nanometer channel, 
you'll pick up hemorrhages and little microaneurysms, and that's kind of what my study was about. Right. And, you know, for those who haven't seen the Anitas device, because it is kind of unique, uh, next time you're at a trade show and walking around, it's sort of eye-popping when you first see the images that this, this thing spits out. It's kind of amazing. So, it's really unbelievable. I mean, I've been using it since 2013, and uh, it really changed the way I practice. So between Anitas and now I have OCT and geography, mm -hmm. you know, I'm doing uh, some research coordinating both of them together. But the Anitas is really amazing for primary care. Because it'll pick, you know, you look up the disease as a spectrum, and obviously the earliest you pick up the disease on the spectrum, the better the outcome. So if we could pick up these little microaneurysms or little hemorrhages that we could see on the needles that you can't, that it's very hard to see, you know, using an ophthalmoscope or a regular fundus camera, uh, a, a regular white light fundus camera, uh, this, this just picks it up much sooner. And the sooner that you pick something up, the better that you could pick, find somebody with insulin resistance. And that's what happened with me is that I had, uh, I had a number of people with these microaneurysms on the anitas. It's something I talked about in my lecture. And at the beginning, I didn't know what these were, these little, you know, these little coagulation swollen spots. And just by studying about insulin resistance, I realized what insulin does and how it causes the blood to coagulate and it causes all uh, the reasons for atherosclerosis uh, decreases fibrinolysis. And I said, I bet you this is from either elevated blood sugar and also elevated blood sugar. We know what that does to the blood vessels. So I wound up doing these blood tests at 17 out of the first 18. I had either fasting, elevated fasting at insulin or two-hour insulin. And many were in the pre-diabetic range of A1C between 5.7 and 6.4. And so, you know, I, I told the people at Anitas, this and you know, I said, I think we, I think I got something there, and uh, this is something we could publish. And they said, uh, No, you can't publish this. I mean, that's not a, an official study. So, we actually did an official study where we did, we, you know, we crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's, and we published a study that was published in Diabetes that showed that microaneurysms seen on the uh, 580 uh, yellow uh, wavelength. Uh, was correlated with insulin resistance somewhere along the spectrum, but mostly with fasting insulin and two-hour insulin. And your insulin could be elevated up to 20 years, or even the studies that show up to 24 years before your blood sugar even goes up. And elevated insulin is, uh, is definitely a marker for, for cardiovascular disease, even without elevated glucose. I mean, there's a number of studies that show that. And elevated insulin also causes... Uh, increases the risk of cancer, increases hypothyroid, becoming hypothyroid. So there's a number of different, it causes retinal hemorrhages. This is a lot of people with pre-diabetics that get retinal hemorrhages, and I say it's probably from elevated insulin so long, more than the elevated glucose. But together, once they're both elevated, mm -hmm. that's a real dangerous combination. And that's why when they look at the studies for people who are on insulin therapy, for type 2 diabetes, they actually die quicker and they have more cancer and more heart attacks than, than uh, people that are, that are not treated with uh, insulin. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was a, that was a study that, that was recently published. I have one question. Uh, do you get a full report from the lab when, you, when they draw blood? Huh? Yeah, I mean, they send a uh, report. What I always tell the patient is that you, I tell the patient, you ask for a report, a full report. They're going to send me the report, okay? So when I get it, I will call you. So sometimes, depending on what it says, I will have the patient come in and we'll do a consultation uh, based on what the, if it's something that I feel I can handle, they'll come in and we'll do a lifestyle consultation uh, because we're picking it so early on the, on the spectrum of diabetes uh, or diabetes or insulin resistance. So it's all interchangeable. Or if it's something that I feel that needs to be taken care of by their primary care or cardiologist, then I'll refer them from, from refer so, them so, onward. So just to be clear, you get the report of the patient? Both. Yes, yes, a full report. You, you get the report. And, and the I do, yeah, the... because my name is on the prescription. So if you look at my lecture, you'll see that I have a prescription uh, and has my name on the top of it. Everybody that saw my lecture 
could use that prescription, and I check off my name, and I get a report from the lab. And the lab doesn't give you a hard time because you're not an MD or a DO. <laughs> never, 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 never. Okay. You know, it's funny. I, I knew that people would ask me that question, but there are states where the public could go and get a blood test. They don't need a doctor's uh, requisition form to get a blood test. They could just walk into any lab and get a blood test. So, you know, there's no, certainly in New Jersey, you know, I guess every state is different, but certainly in New Jersey, there's no problems. Good. This is great information. Hmm. Wow. So I guess if I were going to get started doing this, you know, let's, let's say that you're, you're talking to the average person out there, where would you begin in terms of, of you know, when they, they're seeing their patients every day? Like, what, what's a routine for you? How many do you usually write in a day? Oh, I probably write three or four a week. Hmm. Uh, so the place to start is with my requisition form, my prescription. And, you know, if you see retinal hemorrhage, most of the time, it's from elevated insulin or elevated blood sugar and or both, but it could be from other things. I mean, you could sometimes it could be from elevated homocysteine. I've had patients that was the cause of their hemorrhage. I had LP little a, which I talked about in my lecture. Uh, a young 25-year-old uh, female patient came with a, uh, a, a vein occlusion, a peripheral, a, a branch vein occlusion, mm -hmm. mostly lipid, and uh, they couldn't, nobody could find it out. Kate. She kind of wandered into my office, and we did the full blood test. So if you don't do the right blood test, the doctor is going to say, well, there's nothing wrong with you. Right. But if you do the right blood test, the LP little a, which should be under 40, was 240, and that was the cause of her branch vein occlusion. This LP little a is a very inflammatory genetic mo uh, molecule, or this lipoprotein, that's very inflammatory. So if that's elevated, you have a great chance of having a stroke or a heart attack or a retinal vein occlusion, or uh, or retinal hemorrhages, and that was the cause in, in that patient. You, you know, I guess one of the fears that many docs must have is that they don't feel comfortable with the interpretation of these tests. Right? They can order them, but they may not know enough. So, how, how do you how do you go about actually learning about all all of these different tests and and what they mean? Well, hopefully, they watch my lecture and they can <laughs> learn about it from looking at my lecture. But you know, you know, it's just like learning anything else. You know, the, the knowledge change, turns over every two or three years and what we do. So, not, you know, there was no OCT when I started practicing. There was no uh, GPA when I started practicing. Certainly no OCTA. And I didn't learn D, uh, DGI, but DGH, B, B scan. I didn't, you have to learn it. So you do the test and you just kind of, you kind of learn it. If something's elevated, you just look it up and say, okay, this is abnormal. What does it mean? If you do it enough times, you'll get it. There's not that many tests. Oops. There's not that many tests on my requisition form. I mean, there's enough. I mean, maybe 18 possible ones mm. that I think really apply to us. But you do enough of them, you'll learn it. Great. All right. So I guess the, the moral of the story is everyone should watch that lecture because it's going to be up at least until May 1st. So people can come back and watch and, and look for your requisition form. Absolutely. And uh, if anybody has questions, um, they could certainly, my email is, is there. They, it's drkmg20000 at gmail.com, drkmg20000 at gmail.com. I would be happy to answer anybody's questions. And I, when, we did the, when we did the study and we had 30, we did on 30 doctors, uh, everyone, you know, every one of them had a blood test and I did a consultation with every single one of them and it's just really getting used to doing it. And you really, it's a tremendous service that you can provide to your patients. And look, you know, you know the, the number one cause of, cause of death is cardiovascular disease from insulin resistance. Number two is cancer, also a, insulin resistance being a cause. Number three is stroke. So all these things that are causes of death all are related to insulin resistance. And unfortunately, 50% of the population according to a recent study in JAMA, are either pre-diabetic or diabetic, or if they're over 18, and that means that they're insulin resistant. Hey, you know, 50% of the and people with, in this room are pre-diabetic. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are? Know, so, know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know optometrists, we're the experts. We're vascular experts. We can look at blood vessels every minute, every day, 20 times a day, you know, depending on how many patients we see, 30 times, 40 times a day. Yeah, you know, depending on how many patients we see. So nobody should be more experts on vascular disease than us. And as the, the imaging is getting better 
and the test like Anitas is coming out where they're having this 580 nanometer wavelength. I mean, we're, we're seeing things that are just incredible that could save people's lives and help people with mortality and morbidity great. in an incredible way. It's a great service. Yeah, well, that, 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 I think that's a great way to end. So, Carrie, thanks so much for being here. We're going to post this interview up on ODY so maybe people can ask questions there as well. And if we get any, we'll pass them on to you. Okay, thanks for having me. Okay, thanks for your time. Thanks. Bye.